Welcome to the Brisbane Property Podcast with your hosts, Melinda and Scott Jennison. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Brisbane Property Podcast. My name is Scott Jennison with uh, Streamline Property Buyers. I'm the Acquisitions Manager, um, and we're really, really excited today. We've got a special guest. We've got Tim Lawless, Head of Research for CoreLogic Asia Pacific. Welcome, Tim. Many thanks for having me on the show, Scott and Melinda. Looking forward to it. We are super excited to be um, able to share your wisdom and intel with our audience, Tim. Um, I know that I've seen you present a number of times at industry presentations. Your The information that you share is always valuable to the audience and um, we feel very privileged to be able to you know, share some of that knowledge with our audience here on the Brisbane Property Podcast. And I will, first of all, say thank you for providing us with some more granular information in relation to Brisbane and Brisbane's property market that we're able to share exclusively here on this podcast for the first time. It's going to help our listeners to get a really good understanding of what's been happening at a more granular level. Um, And when we look at Brisbane and we look at CoreLogic data as a whole, I know that um, it does record quite a lot of data when we're looking at that, that, that Brisbane number. Can you help us understand, Tim, what is the data that, that is captured in Brisbane data when CoreLogic releases its, um, its monthly hedonic home value index reports? It's, it's a great place to start. And uh, I think setting that, that, that foundation of what are we actually talking about kind of gets overlooked quite often. So Brisbane, there's a whole bunch of different definitions of Brisbane. So we, we use a standardised definition for the Brisbane boundary. It's based on the Greater Capital City Statistical Area, which the Australian Bureau of Statistics um, maintains. So Greater Brisbane uh, includes the Brisbane local government area, as well as Ipswich and Logan, Redland and Moreton. So I wouldn't say it's you know the entirety of Southeast Queensland, so it excludes the Gold Coast, the Sunshine Coast and getting out to Toowoomba, but it is a massive region. Uh, it goes well beyond what a lot of people might assumed to be Brisbane being being the Brisbane local government area. And each of those, I guess, broad sub-regions seem to have, quite often seem to have a a very different dynamic in their housing markets as well. Yeah, it's interesting. And I know that's something that we often talk about on this podcast, um, the the fact that the data that is released by CoreLogic does cover a large geographical location and what we might be seeing in in a small pocket of Brisbane in the Brisbane City Council region, for example, might not be the same as what's happening in, you know, Ipswich or, or Logan or um, or even parts of Moreton Bay or Redmond's. But can you help me understand, is the data usually fairly accurately spread across those regions or do you see a higher volume of transactions occurring in some regions compared to others, which then might influence or impact on, on those, those monthly trends that we're seeing or, or is the, 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 the hedonic um, regression that you're using, does that account for those, those changes in locations? Yeah, it's, there's two ways to answer that, I think. Um, absolutely, the market's running at different speeds in different regions. So through the, the most recent downturn we've been through or maybe still going through in some areas, it was very um, different from area to area. So, for example, we saw the more affordable end of the marketplace holding its value a little bit better. So getting out to areas like Ipswich and Logan and Redland, um, even Toowoomba, getting out into southeast Queensland, were generally quite resilient markets where we saw larger value falls around the Brisbane local government area, especially some of the more prestige markets as well. And th- then the second part of your question around the methodology, that that's that's the whole idea of a hedonic regression is that it's comparing apples with apples. It tries to, conf- to control for some of that bias that might creep into the market. So if you look at the way to, to measure housing prices, you, you can look at it in a, I guess, a, a sophistication spectrum or a spectrum of sophistication. At one end, a really simplistic level, you've got like an average or a mean uh, or a median. If you're just using a median price, for example, that's going to be massively compositionally biased or skewed by different behaviors in the market. So at a time when we've seen, say, the more affordable end of the marketplace a little bit more robust through this downturn, Arguably, that would have pushed a median price a little bit higher or maybe artificially held it up. Uh, and then you move through the spectrum, then you've got a, say, a stratified median and then a repeat sales index, and you move up into your regression types of, of methodologies. So a hedonic regression is sim- simply 
tries to estimate the value of individual properties based on their attributes, based on you know how many bedrooms it is, how many bathrooms, the land area. Um, and then it looks at surrounding sales and it breaks those surrounding sales up into the individual attributes as well. So we're trying to, I guess, deconstruct the home into its underlying attributes and place a value on each of those and then reconstruct it with an overall valuation estimate. Um, so in that sense, we're trying to control for these sort of biases. There's always going to be some noise creeping into property market measurements. So, you know, I'll be upfront about that. But uh, hedonic regression tends to control the best for uh, for changes in the types of properties that are buying or, 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 uh, or transacting. Thank you. That you have provided a really good summary of um, of that to help listeners understand the difference. Because when CoreLogic do release their monthly um, data, their how their their chart packs, etc., we're talking about the hedonic equation. So it's meant to account for that compositional bias. And and you've mentioned there that the you know obviously it's not perfect, but it's the best that um, that we've got. Um, and I guess that's where you know as as on the ground specialists here in Brisbane overlaying that qualitative research that we do by being out and about every weekend and seeing what is actually transacting and who's turning up at open homes and overlaying that with some of the best data that we have that's being put out by CoreLogic helps us to actually get a really good understanding of of what's happening in certain pockets as a whole. And I know, you know, Tim, we've spoken about, you know, what we see on the ground sometimes doesn't necessarily correlate with some of the broader Greater Brisbane data that that is being put out. And that may be because we're in a certain pocket um, and that data is capturing a, a whole host of information that's outside of the pocket that we might be be looking at. Would you agree with with that sort of assessment? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, housing is really nuanced. Uh, it's not like trying to measure share markets, which are perfectly the same to measure, right? You get a really accurate, uh, very little noise coming out of, say, equity markets, because we know exactly uh, what we're measuring. Housing has different levels of quality, you know, different different uh, um, uh, different aspects, different elevations, all that sort of stuff. So, having that local knowledge is absolutely critical, I think, when you're involved in actually making the decision to buy or sell a property. And I think it's one of the reasons why people will be using a buyer's agent more and more or um, you know, gravitating to the best real estate agents is it's really important to have that localized knowledge. I always say it's really important to, to look at the data, look at the trends, of course. Um, they'll give you a pretty good idea of what's happening, but you need to bridge the gap between the data and the local market conditions. And the only way to do that is to have a pretty good understanding of what's happening at the street level or individual properties. Some of those nuances around, uh, you know, why did a property get a premium or sell for a discount? You just simply can't see it in the data. Mm. Yeah, it's a good observation. And I know that when we're representing clients, for example, and we're, we're analysing recent sales to come to a determination of what the value of, of another property might be, it's always relative to, you know, not just what the data shows us, but what the emotional aspects of what an, where another buyer might see value. And I guess that's that the art of, you know, understanding property values. But look, this podcast is not about, um, you know, pricing properties. It's about some of this more granular information that is available to us that um, you've prepared for us to share on the podcast. So what I'd love to do is, um, is, is provide a little bit of a summary for our listeners in terms of how Brisbane's current performance has been tracking when we compare that to Queensland as a whole um, in other regional parts of Queensland and also how Brisbane's been tracking compared to other capital cities. Can you summarise that for us? Yeah, I'll start really broadly. So looking at, say, the Brisbane, the greater Brisbane area, which is that, that large region we talked about uh, at the very beginning of the, of the, of the show, we have started to see what looks like a, a pretty positive inflection in the market. We've seen two months of growth now up to the end of April. Uh, April, we saw Brisbane housing values up by about 0.3%. Still um, you know, pretty flat over the rolling quarter, like the three months ending April, the market was up 0.1%. So I think a better way to describe the market, uh, at least to the end of April, was more of a stabilization after what's been a really swift drop in housing values. You know, Brisbane home values um, fell by about 11% from their peak, which was roughly around May last year, through to a trough, which seems to be in February. That's that's the biggest drop we've ever seen. Uh, or sorry, it's, it's the biggest drop we've ever seen in Brisbane housing values, at least since 1980, but it's also by far the fastest. 
So if you compare that to, say, regional Queensland, um, the trends aren't really all that different. But remember, if we think Brisbane itself is diverse, regional Queensland <laughs> is, is even more diverse. You know, you've, you've got most of the trends across regional Queensland are really being driven by the headline areas of the Gold Coast and Sunshine Coast and Toowoomba. That's where you've got to remember all of our indices are weighted. So where there's more transactional activity and where there's more dwellings tends to push the headlines around. So regional Queensland um, up 0.8 of a percent over the month and also over the quarter up 0.8 of a percent year to date. So the first four months of, of the year, the market's absolutely flat. But if we drill that down and look at some of the, I guess, the, the stronger movements uh, across the regional markets, you can see over uh, the past three months, we've seen a really broad based recovery. The only sub-region where we haven't seen housing values rise over the past three months was the Wide Bay region. So that includes markets like um, Gympie, uh, getting into um, uh, Rainbow Beach, those sort of markets, uh, Harvey Bay as well. Uh, but interestingly enough, that's also the market that's seen the most growth for, during, the, during the pandemic to date. Wide Bay housing values are still up 44% since mm. uh, March of 2020. So maybe the fact that we haven't seen values rise over the quarter simply comes back to the fact that it had such a strong growth cycle and probably overshot the mark a little bit. But even when you get into regional Queensland, the far flung areas, markets like Townsville, still up 18% since uh, the onset of COVID and values were nearly 2% higher over the rolling quarter. Um, the Mackay region's up 20% through the, the cycle to date and about 2% over the quarter. So yeah, this is looking like a pretty broad based stabilization slash early recovery phase to me, regardless if we're looking at Brisbane itself or or the regional markets. It certainly makes sense. And if we can even break that down more in terms of what might have been happening in the last 12 months here in Brisbane in certain SA3 regions, um, obviously, you know, as you've mentioned, we can look at that um, general or, or greater Brisbane region and, and see that it has um, come off, you know, I think it's about 11% over the last 12 months when we look at the 12 month figures, um, according to CoreLogic. But there's obviously regions or sub regions within that area that have um, not actually declined in value. And in fact, there's a couple of regions that have increased in value over the same period. And then there's others that have um, declined much, much more so than, than the general um, value for all of Greater Brisbane. Can you just provide a couple of examples of where perhaps areas have outperformed the, the general median and, and those that have underperformed? Yeah, so again, I might start with a bit of context. So NSA3 is, a, is a, just another standardised region. So if you think about the greater Brisbane area, it's kind of like a Russian doll. So you can break that down to SA4s, and then SA4s are comprised of SA3s, SA3s are comprised of SA2s, then you go down to even smaller levels. So an SA3 is a, is a pretty intuitive sub-region, relatively small. And when you look at uh, the last 12 months, you've got markets like the Ipswich hinterland, um, getting into areas like Somerset, for example, uh, markets like Bow Desert, they're the two SA3s that have actually recorded a subtle rise in values over the past 12 months, up 0.4 and 1.8% for those two regions. And then the areas that have recorded only a slight decline are kind of similar. They tend to be around those outer western fringe, uh, fringes of, of Brisbane. They tend to be really affordable, quite often larger block sizes, that type of thing. Um, so markets like uh, the Caboolture hinterland, Jimboomba, um, Ipswich inner area is actually seen uh, only a mild drop. At the other end of the spectrum, you've generally got markets that are confined to the Brisbane local government area. They tend to be a little bit higher in price. Nunda, for example, um, uh, was down about 13%. Chermside, so getting into your middle rings, down 16%. Sandgate, about 15%. The Gap, down about 15%. Holland Park and Yoronga, down 15%. So these don't look like you know, your, your absolute premium markets to me. They're not your cream of the crop. They're not your Riverside Hamiltons or Ascots or getting into uh, um, Balimba or Hawthorne or anything like that. So it does seem to be this trend where your really high-end markets have probably been a little bit more resilient than what we give credit to the upper quartile. It seems to be that this um, weakness is more around your middle ring, uh, still in the upper quartile, 
but not quite at your extreme top end of the market where you generally tend to find those really extremely expensive markets are a little bit more insulated from higher interest rates and they tend to be more impacted by global shocks or equity crashes like what we saw in um, the global financial crisis. It makes sense. And um, I'm just wondering when Scott's going to jump in because I'm having a fabulous conversation <laughs> with you, Tim, around data. And I think Scott's, um, you know, anxiously waiting for his opportunity to join the conversation. But I do want to <laughs> carry on from one thing that you've mentioned there because you talked about quartiles. And when we look at the upper 25% of property values here in Brisbane um, for houses, um, anything that sells above $990,755, according to this more granular data that you've provided to us, um, would make up that upper um, quartile. So, you know, that does include a lot of properties that would be selling within the Brisbane City Council region, certainly for houses. Um, anything that is under $608,205 as a house would be considered the lower quartile or the the lowest 25% of property values. So for any listeners wondering, um, you know, whether a property that you own or might be considering buying where it fits in within that quartile data that provides a benchmark for you. Now, when we look at the performance more recently in terms of the upper quartile and the lower quartile and and, and that middle 50% of property values, and we can break that down into both housing and units based on the the, logi- uh, the core logic data that you've provided. How have it, how has each segment been performing, Tim? Yeah, very, very differently. I mean, the, directionally, each of these broad valuation cohorts tends to move in a similar direction, but magnitudinally, it's different. So, if we think about the most recent upswing, um, we generally well, well, actually I'll backtrack a little bit. We typically see that upper quartile of the market, the more expensive markets, leading the cycles. So leading both the upswings and the downturns. And that's been pretty clear. Uh, Brisbane, it probably doesn't stand out as much as some of the larger markets like Sydney and Melbourne. You see this trend a lot more clearly, but you can still see through the pandemic cycle, for example, it was the upper quartile that really led the upswing. At one stage there, we were seeing upper quartile housing values are rising at about 9% quarter on quarter. But as we saw those markets becoming more and more unaffordable, growth kind of rippled out to your middle of the market and then your lower end of the market. In fact, um, it's that lower quartile of the market that actually recorded a higher uh, quarterly rate of growth. It actually peaked at about 10.1% quarter on quarter growth coming into early 2022. So it, it does look like that more affordable end of the marketplace was, first of all, a little bit stronger through the height of the growth cycle and then a little bit more resilient to falling values through the downturn. But now we're starting to see a real change uh, um, as we see the market gathering some confidence and momentum. It looks like that upper quartile is about to overtake, at least on the quarterly numbers, overtake the more affordable end of the marketplace, recording a better performance in terms of value growth. Uh, there's probably another thing happening here. We tend, we generally tend to see your mortgage belts a little bit more sensitive to like um, higher interest rates, uh, especially the time when inflation is persistently high as well. So I think there is a little bit of an argument, and I'm certainly speculating this will be the case, that your mortgage belt areas will take a little bit longer to show a material turnaround just because households are likely to show more thinly stretched balance sheets and that may be where we could see uh, a bit of distress emerging as as long as interest rates remain really high, which which is looking like the, the, the most logical outcome, at least until late this year. So when you talk about those mortgage belts, you're talking about areas um, where affordability is more challenged, perhaps areas where um, incomes, um, the demographic of the area there are on lower household incomes. Is that what you're referencing? Absolutely. So the mortgage belts around Brisbane would be your classic uh, sort of getting to Ipswich, uh, Springfield, um, areas around Logan uh, and getting north up to sort of um, the outskirts of Morton, uh, the, the Morton Council. Um, interestingly enough, if you look at a, a broad sort of dwelling value to income ratio, it, th- those regions actually stand out as being really affordable. But it's really important to compare, say, lower quartile incomes against lower quartile housing values. And once you start doing that, it really highlights that um, your affordability ratios start to blow out in some of those areas. So as we start to see household saving buffers gradually depleting um, with against your know, high cost of living and high cost of debt, there's a pretty good argument that some of those mortgage belt areas will probably be a little bit more sensitive. It's a good point to raise because I know, you know, 
for those looking to get into the market or who are already in the market as property investors, a lot of the areas that you've identified are areas that a lot of people have purchased into um, because they're affordable locations and because typically they've been higher income or higher yielding locations. Um, however, affordability is measured not just in the ability for um, residents to service a mortgage, but also their ability to serve, service rent. And actually there are going to be affordability caps in terms of rental um, affordability in some of these locations as well. And one thing I noticed in the data that you sent through is that um, the magnitude of growth in the housing market has um, started to decline in Brisbane, whereas in the unit market, it's continued to escalate month on month just over the last quarter. Um, and perhaps that's an indication that we're meeting our affordability caps um, for housing in some of these, these areas where people just can't afford to pay more rent. What are your observations around that data? I would absolutely agree with that. And um, it, it makes sense that as, as affordability remains pretty stretched, even though prices have come down like 11% in Brisbane, we're still seeing a dwelling value to income ratio across the broad region. It's about 7.6 times. That simply means that your median household will uh, spend about 7.6 times their income in order to buy the median priced dwelling in, in market. I mean, that's a lot lower than Sydney. Sydney's at 9.6, Melbourne's at eight times but it's still historically quite high. So that probably implies that um, for people who are looking to buy into the marketplace, they will be forced into looking at maybe those outer fringes we we're just talking about or looking at uh, something that's medium to high density. If you just look at Brisbane, uh, again, looking at median values here, the median value for a house in Brisbane is about $782,000. The median value for a unit is a little bit less than five hundred thousand dollars, so you know, roughly a three hundred thousand dollar difference here. It makes a massive amount of difference, especially when lenders are pretty cautious about lending on, say, high loan to valuation ratios or high debt to income ratios as well. Another factor that could be supporting the unit market as well is we haven't seen a great deal of new supply coming into Brisbane's medium to high density sector, and that's been the case since about two thousand seventeen. It's come out of what was arguably an oversupply to a market now that's pretty chronically undersupplied. And uh, we're not seeing many dwelling approvals coming through yet either. So a couple of years from now, I think the situation will be even worse. So long term, and sorry, I think Scott, you were about well, to say I was, something. I was, going, I was actually going to jump in, Tim, because uh, just secretly, I know every time you've presented, Melinda usually gets up and asks a question. So I think she did quietly say to me, don't talk. I want to say everything to Tim in this <laughs> podcast. But uh, um, just one thing we do notice a lot and on the ground here is is our listing numbers. I mean, we, we're seeing so many buyers out and about, and I do talk on our podcast to people. I bring it back down to earth a bit and talk about what we actually see on the ground. And we are seeing really high numbers at auctions and open homes, but our listing numbers seem really, really low. Um, can you give us a bit of an insight on that side of things? Yeah, it's so true. And we're definitely seeing that in our data. And it's not just a Brisbane thing, it's happening around the country where through this, this downturn, it looks like a lot of people who've been thinking about selling their home have just been waiting, waiting it out. They've been waiting on the sidelines. So when we measure listing numbers, we measure both the flow, so how many new listings are being added to the market, and then also the total inventory levels. So that's total stock levels, like new, newly advertised as well as relisted properties. So if you look at the number of new listings coming into the Brisbane marketplace over the past uh, four weeks up to the middle of May, it's about 26% below what you describe as normal for this time of the year. Uh, we saw nearly 3,000 listings added to the marketplace over uh, the four weeks ending the 7th of May. Uh, so that's about 26% below the five-year average, and it's about a third less than what we saw a year ago. And then if you look at uh, the total number of listings in the market, that's tracking nearly 40% below the five-year average. So we've got this interesting situation where there's not a lot of fresh stock being added to the market. Sure, demand has come down as well. So the number of home sales has, has reduced, but back to about average levels. So you've got total listings about 40% below average, total demand about at average, which means, as you say, you know, there's, there's a lot of competition for a relatively small pool of available properties, which means clearance rates have, have actually uh, pumped a little bit higher. We've seen homes selling relatively quickly and discounting rates have been holding relatively firm as well with, with not a great deal of negotiation happening. Mm. 
It's interesting. Um, it's definitely what we're seeing on the ground. And of course, you know, we're um, always suggesting that there's a plight to quality and any of those old listings that are not selling, um, it's not so much a fact of um, there's not uh, the buyers, it's just that buyers are actually more concentrated on the quality listings. So um, yeah, interesting trends that uh, we've been observing. And, and I think the data absolutely reflects what we've actually been seeing as well. Um, in terms of Brisbane compared to other capital cities, obviously, you know, we're seeing this heightened um, demand right now. You've mentioned that that's in line with the longer term demand um, indicators. And I think we all compare what happened, you know, only two years ago when we were in the height of the post-COVID boom when demand was just um, excessively above um, normal. Um, and I think that, you know, for a lot of us, that's that's still a recent memory. So whilst demand is lower than it was then, it, it's just back to what, you know, the standard would be. But we're seeing this population movement into Queensland. We've obviously got the international borders open again. Um, Brisbane is still much more affordable than um, a lot of other capitals and potentially one of the reasons why we're seeing more people relocate. Just how affordable is Brisbane compared to the likes of Sydney and Melbourne? Yeah, it's remarkably affordable. And uh, this comes after, as you said, Melinda, you know, housing prices in Brisbane rocketed through the pandemic. It was one of the best performing regions around the country. We saw values rise by a little bit more than 40% from the, the beginning of COVID in March 2020 through to the peak, which was around June 22. Um, but even despite that, we're still seeing Brisbane's typical dwelling value. So houses and unit, units combined is about $705,000. Compare that to Sydney, which is still just over a million bucks, so $1.03 million to buy the typical dwelling in Sydney. Um, nearly one point, well, a bit over 1.25 to buy a house in Sydney is a typical value. Melbourne and Brisbane are getting a little bit closer, though. Remember, Melbourne was a, one of the softer performers through the cycle, the, the, the upswing, uh, you know, because of the fact that it had a lot of lockdowns and people were leaving in droves. That really detracted from demand. So Brisbane and uh, uh, compared to Melbourne is about a, a, a $45,000 difference now between the medians. Melbourne at 751,000, Brisbane at 705. So yeah, definitely a diminishing gap between Brisbane and Melbourne. But uh, you know, it's one thing having really affordable housing prices, but the other thing is we've got a pretty strong economy in Queensland as well. So the beautiful recipe of you know there's jobs to be had, relatively low unemployment, and a relatively affordable market. And arguably, you get a bit of a lifestyle dividend um, by moving into southeast Queensland as well. I think that's why we're seeing uh, this strong migration trend. Overseas migration nearly back at record highs in September last year, and it's going to get, be getting higher. It's probably already su surpassed record highs. Interstate migration has come back from the highs of COVID, but the trend is still pretty clearly a continuation what was from what was happening pre-COVID, which is interstate migration, so the number of people moving to Queensland um, minus the number of people moving away from Queensland is still really high. It's the highest of any state by some margin. And uh, those two factors obviously contributing massively to housing demand. One thing that, um, you know, came out in the data that you shared with us, which is absolutely fascinating. Uh, we've talked a lot on the Brisbane Property Podcast about um, the rental crisis here in Brisbane. We know vacancy rates are extremely tight and we've shared a lot of that data every month on our, our market updates. But what is um, very relevant here is that a very large portion or a larger than normal proportion of investors actually offloaded their properties um, here in Brisbane. Can you talk through some of that data? Because I think that that is also relevant to the fact that, you know, there's not enough rental properties available for, for tenants right now. And, and perhaps it's because um, a lot of investors have got out of the market. Yeah, I think that's definitely one of the factors. We're seeing vacancy rates in Brisbane around 1%, even lower than that in the unit market now. So a big factor would be the rental supply side of things. So when we look at rental supply, there's a few things we'd like to look at. It's uh, how much private sector investment is happening. And as you say, Melinda, we saw a lot of investors offloading through the peak of the growth cycle. I think that was partly, you know, a bit of um, you know, this profit taking happening. So, so normally, I'll backtrack. Normally, we'd see about 26% of Brisbane listings would be investment listing or investment owned listings. Through the height of the pandemic growth cycle, we saw that um, escalate up to 41%. So 41% of listings coming to market were investment owned. That's reduced back to about 30% now. So still well above long run average. 
And I think the reason we're still seeing an elevated level of investment listings probably comes back to two things. One being, you know, the, the cost of holding a property and investment property is a lot higher now, even though we're seeing uh, we're seeing rents rising quite substantially. You know, Brisbane rents are up about two hundred and seventy five dollars a month over the past year. But your holding costs just to pay to pay back your mortgage are up about eight hundred and forty dollars a month. And that's based on data to April. So with the latest um, rate hike in May, that's going to be a little bit of a larger difference now. So I think more and more investors are probably finding it harder to hold their property. But then there's also a lot more uncertainty as well. There's plenty of things we could point to that I'm sure you've covered off in the podcast previously around a changing playing field, uh, policy, policy changes, tenancy reform. And, and fair enough, some of those reforms are legitimate and, and needed. But at the end of the day, I think a lot of investors are feeling disempowered uh, around how they can control um, their, their asset. And they're probably exiting the market because they have less certainty in uh, in, in in their their investment um, uh, going forward. Interesting observations. And um, look, thanks for sharing that because that's something that, you know, we've talked a lot about and um, it's come out through some other surveys that um, property investment professionals of Australia have conducted as well. But um, to see that in the data um, that you've shared with us as well, um, it's an interesting trend and certainly has been one of the contributing factors to the current rental crisis that we have here in Brisbane. And, and the long-term supply, Tim. So when you talked about, I look, I look at the construction, my background is the construction industry and approvals, um, they're obviously staying low. We're not seeing a lot. You talked about that supply, the oversupply in the late 2016, 2017, um, and then for, for buildings and, um, and new approvals, they're obviously sitting sitting low as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everybody would remember Home Builder. We saw an absolute surge in, in house approvals that then led into a lot of house uh, detached houses under construction. That ran into a whole bunch of supply chain constraints around labor supply, material supply, rising construction costs. But it, in, in, in essence, the home builder policy basically brought forward demand, and now we're on the downside of that. So we've been seeing house approvals in Brisbane. They retreated back to uh, the long run average by sort of uh, sort of early to mid 2022, and since then they've gone way below average. So. We're definitely seeing house approvals not showing any signs of starting to tick up just yet. But unit approvals have held below the decade average. Well, they, they returned it to, to average levels about 2017 and dropped below average in about 2019 and haven't really changed too much in terms of the number of um, medium to high density approvals coming through. Uh, we are starting to see the high rise sector show a little bit of an upwards trend now after a long period of, of being very weak. So that's good news. I think Brisbane does need more medium to high density supply, especially when you consider how tight rental markets are. But the reality is, even if we do start to see approvals turning around, it's it's a really slow burn. It takes a long time to deliver this stock to the market, especially in that high density uh, side of the market, where it's a good two years from an approval through to completion, maybe even longer now that we're still seeing uh, some uh, some bottlenecks in the, the the residential construction sector. So, Tim, just um, obviously we've summarised a lot of the the fundamentals around Brisbane, and there's a lot of um, talk about this pending mortgage cliff, and you know the fact that a lot of people that have been on fixed interest rates. Um, since the height of the pandemic, they're coming off those fixed interest rates um, now, but also in the months ahead. How do you see this as a, as a pending risk for Brisbane specifically? Um, and is this something that, uh, you know, property owners, uh, property investors, people that potentially are looking to buy need to be concerned about? Are there bargains that are likely to be coming? Well, yeah, it's definitely a risk. I think the fact that we're seeing around 800,000 mortgages nationally um, that are going to be moving from a fixed rate of around you know, 2% and in some, some cases a bit less than that, up to something closer to the mid fives, maybe even higher than 6%, depending on, on how much you can refi for, then yeah, absolutely. That's a massive step change. But I don't think it's going to be, to be a material risk that leads to uh, a noticeable surge in, say, motivated selling or distressed selling. So the reason I think that is it's not like this is going to be a shock for those borrowers. Uh, it's been well telegraphed. Any Any lender would have been communicating and coaching their their borrowers to start budgeting for this a long time ago. 
So I think that's the most important thing is it's not going to be a shock factor that tends to uh, come out of the blue. The other reason would be looking at, say, um, uh, all those borrowers who are on variable interest rates, uh, which is still the, the vast majority of borrowers, they've generally kept up to date with their mortgage repayments pretty well. You know, looking at some of the APRA data, at least up to the end of last year, which is the most current set of data, uh, the, the proportion of loans that were tracking less than 90 days behind in their repayments went from like 0.3% to 0.4% of the entire mortgage portfolio. It's tiny. I think we'd be naive to think that arrears won't rise. Absolutely, they will. And I think most banks have been, been pretty clear that they're expecting that as well. But I'd be very surprised if we did see, uh, you know, that the key metric being that the 90-day arrears rate getting from, at the moment, it's like 0.5 or 0.6%. I don't think it'll get materially above 1%. Mm. Um, so in that sense, no, I don't think it's going to be a major risk to the marketplace, but absolutely there will be some borrowers who simply can't make those extra payments. Hopefully lenders are uh, still quite flexible and, and generous in their forbearance. We certainly saw that through the pandemic. And Australian lenders, I think you could say, have a pretty good track record of trying to work with borrowers uh, rather than you know forcing them into the marketplace. There's generally um, uh, quite a bit of cooperation unless it looks pretty clear like that borrower has no chance of getting back into their repayment cycle. So, Tim, I, I've got my voice into the back end of this podcast pretty well, I think. <laughs> I'll, I'll throw a quick one at you. Your outlook for Brisbane, what do you think lies ahead for us? Yeah, I think uh, it, it will be a, um, a bit of a, a mixed forecast. I think the coming months, even though we are looking at a market that's now moving back into some level of growth, it seems uh, it, it'll be interesting to see how sustainable that is. You know, a current rolling four-week uh, measure of Brisbane housing values is up about 1%. It's, it's been a pretty sharp improvement in the, the, the rate of growth. The, the reason I'm a bit sceptical about how, how sustainable that is, is we talked a bit before about, say, affordability still being quite stretched. You know, confidence is still generally quite low. If we did see rates rise again, and that seems to be unlikely, but it's definitely not impossible, then that would probably have a further dampening effect on the marketplace as well. So I think the near-term outlook is probably one for more of very mild growth to stability. But then coming into 2024, maybe even late this year, as soon as we start to see interest rates coming down, I think that's probably the catalyst for growth rates to start to pick up a little bit. At that time, you may even find that APRA eases back on their serviceability buffer from, say, a 3% buffer back to 2.5%, maybe introducing a mortgage floor or a mortgage rate floor of 7%. Um, that frees up credit a little bit and probably also helps to boost confidence. And they're two really important factors for the market. So I think that's probably the, the, the key thing to watch for is when does uh, uh, when does the cost of debt start coming down and when does interest, uh, uh, um, sorry, uh, credit become a bit more available that will probably be the policy change we're looking for to really see a new growth phase emerging in the marketplace. And Tim, just to um, to expand a little bit more on what you've just said, if we consider the prospects over the next five to 10 years for Brisbane as a capital city and, and compare what those prospects look like um, against prospects for, for other capital city or regional locations, how do you think Brisbane fares in terms of, you know, looking at the fundamentals and looking at, um, you know, what might lie ahead? Are you able to shed some light on your opinion there? Yeah, I mean, it's always hard to know what the uh, what the forecast is going to be, especially at the moment with so much uncertainty. But you'd have to look at Brisbane's fundamentals. We've got a market that's relatively affordable, at least compared to the larger capital cities, a market that's benefiting from extraordinarily strong demand side pressures, both from overseas migration and interstate migration, and a relatively um, small le level of supply in the market. Even the pipeline of dwellings coming through that have been approved is well below average. So it looks like an imbalance between supply and demand will probably persist. That puts Brisbane in a pretty uh, pretty good position. On top of that, you've also got this fact that I think there's some long longevity in people being able to work remotely. And if you can be on, say, Sydney or Melbourne money and base yourself in Southeast Queensland, I think uh, we will see uh, people taking advantage of that, um, especially considering you know, commuting out of Brisbane to other major capitals is, is pretty straightforward. So, yeah, I, if I was putting my money anywhere in Australia, um, I'd probably be looking at Perth, to be honest, uh, um, as a number one option because it's just so cheap, uh, though it's quite volatile. And then I'd be looking at Southeast Queensland.
You've heard it here on the podcast. Tim Lawless will put his money second place in Southeast <laughs> Queensland, first place in Perth, but um, not a bad outlook for anyone that uh, would be looking to to get into the market. Um, obviously, there's a lot of opportunity that lies ahead and certainly opportunity that lies ahead in any market if you do understand at a local level, um, you know, those supply and demand metrics that we talked about right back at the beginning of this podcast episode. So I appreciate you sharing your, your thoughts and opinions with us, Tim. Tim, I, look, I know that when all this information comes through, when Melinda asked you to come on the podcast, um, Melinda being the data nerd especially, um, was super excited. Um, I, look, I sat back, I might have not said a lot in this podcast, but I did listen and took in a lot of information. Uh, it's fascinating, the information and the data you guys put out, um, and it's it's quite amazing for us to have a look at. So I really appreciate, one, you coming on the podcast and also sharing this information with, you, uh, with us and our listeners as well. So thanks very much, Tim. Many yeah, thanks. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks, thanks, <laughs> we, thanks, guys. Yeah, we really appreciate it. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm not afraid of saying that um, I do love data coming from a research background. So the more data that I can and that I can look at and analyze and overlay with what we're seeing on the ground, it sometimes helps us to make sense of, um, you know, the, the market as a whole, because data is great. But as you've mentioned right back at the beginning, overlaying that, that qualitative data with that quantitative data is what helps us to make the most sense of what is actually happening. Tim, we appreciate you um, gathering this more granular data for us to share on this podcast. I'm sure our audience will appreciate um, a lot of the information that you shared. And um, also thank you for your time. It is very, we're very grateful that you've made the time to speak to us today. Thanks guys. I'll see you next time. Okay, well, I'll, I'll let Melinda wrap it up as, you, as usual. Again, thanks, Tim, very much for that. We made look. Our, our listeners will very appreciate it. It's been a little bit longer episode than um, than usual, but well worth it. Um, you're welcome back anytime you like right, to have a chat with us. Um, open arms there. So thanks very much again. As I said, Melinda will wrap it up. It's been great talking, and we'll talk again next week. Thanks very much for listening, and bye for now. And if you've enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and uh, share the episode with friends and family. There's so much value that Tim Lawless has shared with us today. Um, and I'm sure that there's a lot of other people that could benefit from hearing this information. Um, as always, we hope you have a fabulous week and we look forward to speaking with you again. Bye for now.